All right, as usual, let's now start with some announcement. I think uh, quite a good number of uh, things that you want to keep in mind. Just, uh, uh, they're actually going to happen very soon. Your assignment number one has been released. Okay, let me just show you how you can get there. Of course, if you go to the E-Class site for the course, let me make it a little bit bigger for you. You can see under assignments, we got assignment one instruction PDF. Uh, please make sure you read it carefully. It that way actually outlines how, you sub, uh, how to, uh, you're supposed to submit as well. And notice that for the submit, we're going to go for command line submission. For those of you who may never try to actually submit through the command line, if you need help, let me know. Otherwise, it's uh, actually quite straightforward. And also, there's a starter project there, Java, and that actually contains some starter code for you to start with. I will encourage you to try maybe additional test cases, you will see. For assignment number one, we are not really using uh, GUnit test just yet, only console output for a reason, you will see. So I would suggest, I'm not gonna uh, bother you with the assignment number one instruction today. I will assume everybody will start working and then next Tuesday or Thursday, I can discuss that a little bit. Not necessarily the solution, but I wanna discuss in, a, in the higher context why it will fit in to our course. I think that's more important for you to see why we're doing this assignment. There's a reason for that. All right? do you guys have any immediate concern about assignment number one? Okay, so, and as I said in the beginning of the semester, as long as you submit your best effort, you definitely get the full marks, but make sure you submit before the deadline. Okay, there'll be no excuses for missing the deadline. Okay, uh, just a few more things I want to mention quickly. For your assignment number one, it involves about trans, uh, translating or compiling from one notation to another. For example, you want to go from NFA into DFA by following certain conversion technique. That's something I assume you may have learned about in 2001, but we'll review them anyway in the lecture. But just notice that one, two things. Number one, all the slides you will need for you to brush up the memory about conversion, it's already, uh, I'm gonna put it right after class today, but th there are certain exercises I wanna do together with you today. So that's why I didn't make the slides available, but you will see them definitely early uh, tonight. And our discussion about those slides will be uh, hopefully Wednesday, uh, sorry, hopefully Thursday and uh, uh, Tuesday the latest. So we'll definitely get some discussion as well on those slides. But you did, there should, should be no way, no reason that you want to uh, wait for me. Okay, just get started for assignment number one. All right, for, us, for your programming test, right, based on the majority preference, not really all of them, I'm afraid, but it's definitely by, by the majority. We're going to fix this time over here, 2 p.m. to 3.30, okay? Saturday, October 29th, 80 minutes, okay? And it's actually going to be most likely in the Lausanne building. And I'm going to book like a, like a room for all of us so we can actually keep a good distance and also we're gonna take the test over there. I'll try to give you some example tests as well beforehand. You can definitely try it out just to get prepared. My intention for the programming test is really to make sure you actually study the Antler 4 tutorial and also you understand what's going on and you can do things from scratch by yourself. So it wouldn't be too tricky, so I would say, all right? And for those of you who just arrived, just for your information, so your programming test has been confirmed. It's going to be 2 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. on Saturday, October 29th. If this time was not somehow preferred by you when you filled out the survey, Still, please try to make a, a prior arrangement to make it. It would be difficult to give a makeup test. If you really got something to discuss with me, I'll be also happy to talk, maybe during my office hour. All right. And when I say semi-confirmed over here, I just need to book the room. I don't think it's gonna be packed. Uh, I don't think it's gonna be reserved, but I'm gonna talk to the department as soon as I can. So I will definitely, but you can assume it's gonna happen this time. And for your quiz number one, it's going to happen next Tuesday, okay? If you look at the calendar over here, it's, uh, there should be no surprise over there. Okay, so go to the lecture site and go to the calendar oh, over here. Yep. So we are here today, 20th, and it's going to take, take place before the lecture. So make sure you arrive in time. I can wait you guys for maybe about two or three minutes, that's okay, but just make sure you come here at time. The elevator usually is very, uh, has a very long line. Just come here earlier, me the same, or take stairs. It's a pretty healthy choice. So quiz number one next uh, Tuesday. Um, so the coverage, you can assume, is going to be from lecture one up to and including lecture number five. Okay, that's something you can assume. 
And it's going to be paper test, so just please bring your pencil, eraser, you know, whatever you prefer in writing, but it's going to be a, a paper test. Okay. I can talk a little bit more, maybe on Thursday, if you got any question. All right, let me move on. Uh, one more. So one of you wrote to me asking the following. I thought there might be some of your doubts as well. Is there any reason I need to uh, wait to go through the Antler 4 tutorial series on YouTube over the reading week? Do you have to wait, right? If you remember what I mentioned in the beginning of the course, if you look at the lecture site, you can see under tutorial, there's an Antler 4 tutorial over here. I would say your cl classmate question is very valid. I would say, no, you don't really have to wait. I'm going to assign the reading week for you to study that tutorial series. I think that was about three to four hours, if I remember correctly. But if you really want to get ahead, you're interested in starting, you're not going to waste time if you start now. Uh, it's going to require knowledge about regular expression, which we'll talk about today. Also, context-free grammar, if you took uh, 2001, that should not be tricky for you to follow the tutorial. I think the only part that might be slightly trickier, for those of you who didn't take the 3311, uh, software design course. You may not have seen the so-called composite and visitor design patterns. However, I would say even if you're, you haven't seen that before, you can still follow the tutorial. There will be certain parts which I'll mention the design patterns. You can maybe take a note to see which part you may want to revisit later. I think you can still go through. That, uh, if you go through the tutorial now, that can save you some time in the reading week. Optional, if you want to. And after the reading week, uh, immediately following the reading week, I will talk about the two design patterns. I think that'll be the right time. All right. Do you guys got any questions about the announcement I just made? Anything that's not clear or you want to talk about? Everybody's okay? Yeah, please. The most important thing, programming test. Make sure you clear up your schedule for that particular block of time, please. All right. I'm going to make it official by announcing that in e-class today as well, so we have a record. All right. All right, if no question, I'm going to start the lecture today. Okay. So what I will do is I'm going to go back to the slides. And okay, so this is where we were last time. We tried to you know, do a little exercise in a class to see how you may specify this part to make uh, that English statement more formal. Right? That's what we did last time. And you just remember uh, briefly, that's what we did. Uh, actually, so let me just use one of them. Let's say this one here. Remember this notation here, sigma to the power of k. And I'll give you a little bit of look ahead. So here, the sigma here is about an alphabet. Right? Very soon in today's class, you will see something called l to the power of k, where l is actually a language. So somehow the subs uh, so the superscript k is overloaded for the notation. So you want to make sure you, you are clear about the distinction between the two. But we'll get there. Just want, want to have some look ahead. And just for this one here, I just want to write down what I had in the slides and then just remind you quickly about the syntax for set comprehension. It's going to be basically every member in the set is going to be a string w. It can be any dummy variable you may choose. And then we want to say the length of that string should be exactly equal to k. And also, you might say w is a member of sigma star, right? It's actually your sound string, right? That's kind of the notation you will be expected to write in the, in the quiz. I mean, the, yeah, in the quiz next week, right? Just make sure we'll go over as many examples as we can. And then if you got any alternative you want to ask me about, drop by my office hour or email me. We can definitely talk to get you prepared, all right? Okay, and okay, it, since it's going to be your first quiz, I'm going to mark uh, the tricky part myself. So I'll be a little bit more lenient for the very first time. So I'll also write some feedback for you on the quiz paper so you can just pick up uh, the math. Alrighty, that's about what, where we were. And let's now move on. Okay. My hope is, I can, I can see the scanner part could be a little bit dry, since it's mostly reviewing what you learned from 2001. But it's really part of the curriculum, so we have to do it. Okay. We'll see how that goes. If you guys feel very comfortable, we can go pretty smooth. If you guys really struggle with, uh, maybe from your previous misunderstanding, we can stay a little bit longer. That's okay. We'll see. All right. 
All right, so let's see the next one. Oh, how about this? A very simple exercise is over here. Guys, how do you, for example, that could be a quiz question. First of all, what does that really mean when I put this expression over here? 0, 1 is a set to the power of 2. What does that mean? You want to understand what it means before you can derive it, right? Anybody want to try? Uh, I'll go with you next one. How about you first? You're getting there. Let's uh, we're going we're going a little bit more precisely. You're basically saying the set of strings of length two from alphabet zero one. That's basically what you meant. Good, awesome. All right. So for this one here, how many are there? Four. Four. Okay. That's that, that that's actually good. I'll actually generalize it for you as well. So for this one here, you're right. There will be four. Okay. Let's now. We can generalize that slightly. Let's say this. Oh, let me just write it down. 0, 1. And then we say to the power of 2, right? You can think about this part over here is an alphabet. Only this part. And then this part over here to the power of 2, we are basically saying all strings. from or over the alphabet 0, 1 with length 2. And apparently, the cardinality of this set, the size, is actually 4. Why don't we make it more general? Let's say, understand what, what, what I'm trying to write here. This part alone, all the strings over alphabet sigma of length k. And I'm asking how many there are. Anybody who want to try? Yes. Number of, OK, let me help you a little bit. Number of alph alphabet in sigma, and then? to the power of k. Yes, I agree. But when you say the number of uh, like a symbols, maybe what, that's what you meant, the number of symbols in sigma to the power of k. Right? So the way to write it would be, so, the no, so that would be the cardinality of sigma to the power of k. Right? So hopefully you can understand why this is equal to this. Right? We're just removing k outside. That's synthetically what happens. But you should understand semantically what that means. We're OK with this, right? So don't be too surprised if I give you maybe another example alphabet and ask you to either figure out the cardinality or maybe to figure out the set numeration of the uh, strings. Okay? Let's make sure everybody's okay. Awesome. That one is done. And how about this one here? This one, sigma to the power of zero. We're basically asking the set of strings over sigma but the length is exactly zero. What would that be? Uh, empty set. Let me try that first. Yep. So what we are having here is, so when you say this one here, we're asking what, compare this with this, length two versus length zero. Right, and I uh, maybe I heard uh, if I heard you correctly. Initially, you said it's simply empty set, or you change your mind. And to say epsilon as a single elements. Okay, how about this? Number one, number two, number three. Which one is correct? Or you think there are more than one answer that's correct? Three? Why two is not correct? It's not a set. Because language should really be a set of strings, right? Good. All right. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, guys, please. That's uh, the basic ones I'm hoping uh, we can review and get right. All right. 
there will be some tricky cases uh, very soon when we talk about languages, but we'll get there, right? So this one is not right because that's simply a language. Oh, well, that's not even a language. It should be non-empty, right? Actually, I think language can be empty. Beg your pardon. Alphabet cannot be empty, but it's just an empty language with no acceptable strings inside. And this one here is not even a language, okay? Awesome. Let's now move on. Okay, so this, this one here, I'm going to just go to, uh, actually, we can do a little bit of derivation just to make sure you're comfortable with the math. So when you say sigma to the power of plus, that simply means it is the set of non-empty strings. How do we formulate this? Let's try that. I mean, start, start you with very quickly. And then we can see how we can uh, simplify it. Sigma plus. Okay, we certainly know it's not empty string, right? So it cannot be sigma zero, cannot be. So it's going to be sigma one union sigma two union sigma to the power of three and etc. Right? It's going to be the language. So there are different ways for you to actually simplify this. One way, which I suggested in this slide, I'll just go there directly. Right? We can do exercise maybe for other things. This one here is going to be just that, right? Let's see how, how we can understand it. We say that it's going to be the set of strings W. Usually I use W for string. W should be a string over sigma of certain length. And the length K must be greater than zero. That's basically what we're saying, right? Hopefully you're okay with this. And if you like, you can also try the following, which I'm okay with, with that as well. Remember we talk about a generalized union operator. You can also try alternatively, generalized union over here. You can say maybe I, uh, let me use K, that may be better. K, strictly larger than zero, sigma K. That means to union all the sigma to the power of K, where K is larger than zero. That one's okay too. Right? You can either try this one here or the one on the slides, which I turned out actually to give to you. I forgot. All right, good. Either way. Okay, this one here, sigma star, very similar to sigma plus, but now we're saying that it could include the empty string. Okay, and this one here, obviously, we can define that just by like that, right? We say, think about sigma star is all the strings. You can, de uh, you can derive from this particular alphabet. It's going to be all the non-empty string union with just the empty string. All right, so that's the definition. Are we okay with this so far about the definitions, guys? Okay, hopefully it's not too, too, not too fast, not too slow, I hope. There will be some exercises. Uh, I would suggest the following. Why don't I just go over very quickly what the question is about with you, and then you guys try. I will choose some of them to actually go over the solution. I think some of them, it might be worth our attention together. I'll do that on Thursday, so you guys got a chance to actually go over that. And then some of them, if you're interested in show me, showing me maybe the proof or explanation, maybe drop by my office hour, we can do that too. Okay. okay, so the first one here is something that we spoke about, right? About what's the cardinality of all the English alphabet lowercase, right? That one should be straightforward, but I can tell you the answer maybe on Thursday. And this one here is kind of the, the other flavor of asking the same question. This is to say derive in a systematic manner. When I say systematic, that means you wouldn't really confuse yourself along the way. You want to know how to derive that exactly, right? Think about one and two. They are kind of relevant to each other. Okay, I'll talk about one and two on Thursday, but you want to try first. And number three here, we can do it right away. I think that's a good, good time to clarify. Explain the difference between sigma and sigma one. Yes. Exactly, yeah. Yes, that's very good. Let me elaborate on your 
uh, explanation, which is perfect, but another, just one example quickly, okay? This one potentially could be a little bit confusing, could be. Okay, let's see here. Let's say we got, let's say sigma is equal to, for example, let's say AB, right? Only two symbols, okay? When we got sigma to the power of one, funny enough, it's also going to be AB, right? They're different, conceptually. A here is a symbol, alphabet symbol. A here is a string of length one, right? It's very worth clarifying this, okay? All right, let me go on to the next one. Okay, this one, proof or disapproof, you guys can try this, you know, feel free to collaborate uh, with each other just about uh, the answer you want to uh, show, okay? Okay, that's about the four exercises I would suggest you give a try, okay? I'll go over one and two briefly on Thursday. Yes? Oh, you mean in this case, right? In this way, no. Yeah. You're right. Uh, let's say, for example, if you are defining like an IDE for this kind of mathematical symbol, you might decide to say in the, in the context of this, you might maybe highlight them maybe as red. In this case, you might highlight them as green. But I know, conceptually, uh, they are different. But just in this, uh, when you write out in the text, they look the same. Yeah. Good. That's a good question. Valid concern. All right, languages. Now we're done with strings. We're done with the uh, alphabet, strings, and languages. We got two more to go. Languages and problem. Okay, languages. So we say a language, L, over a certain alphabet. Alphabet should be finite. It cannot be empty. Is a set of uh, strings such that L is a subset of sigma star. Typically, L should not be the entire sigma star. It should not be. We'll explain that in a moment. Okay, and uh, it's just a subset, right? So L is a language you're talking about, and sigma star is all the possible string you can derive from the from the alphabet, despite their length. All right. And so, uh, okay, let me just go over some example. For example, here, I wonder if you guys have to characterize what a language of Java is. How would you describe it? How would you do that? That's why I didn't want to make the slide available just yet, so we can think about it, right, just for the first time. So here, I want to give some Boolean condition. Oh, by the way, Boolean condition does not need to be mathematical. Just use natural language, that'll be okay. How would you characterize all the string called proc, like a program, that would be like a compilable Java program? When I say compilable, that means you wouldn't get any red underline in Eclipse. You have some smile. Does that mean you want to try? Actually, you know what? In some way, I agree. Because they should compile. But to be more elaborate, it should be no syntax error, no pipe error. That would be a little more elaborate, right? Because typically, if you got red underline, that means you got either syntax or type error. However, what exactly is the input? Input is basically whatever you type from the keyboard, right? So that's kind of the missing condition. Let me show to you. If you, do, if you guys don't agree, just shout it out. I say program is a member of, well, let's take a look what we're doing here. Remember sigma key, which is what we said before, right? It's an alphabet. Sigma key is all the key stroke you can type from the keyboard. And then we're saying that proc is any string of any length from that you can type from the keyboard. That particular string, which will be treated by Java compiler as a single line of string, including new line character, including tab, including everything. That string there should have no compilation error, which, which, which is what you said, compiles. I, I agree, definitely. And I just uh, make a little bit more elaboration there. There should be no lexical, syntactical, or type errors. So I would say, you know, understanding even this will be kind of an inch, uh, will be important because we are having two separation of concerns over here, right? So one is about what string uh, can be, 
And also, what's the property of the string? You should really need both, right? Okay. All right. Let's go on, move on. If you got any concern about example, you can just uh, interrupt me in case. Which one? Which uh, which part? You mean those characters cannot be typed on the keyboard? Like what? Like a zero with white space, a Chinese character. Uh huh. Uh, like the right to left Unicode control character. All of these weird things can be used in Java. Okay. Sure. Sure. Yep. So that would be the special boundary cases for sure. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. So your name? Uh, Henry. Henry. Okay, Henry. Yeah. We should really know your name. You're actually the one of the. Uh, most participants uh, in the class, which is good. Nothing wrong with that. So Henry actually said a very good point. There might be some characters which you, you, don't, you cannot necessarily type from the keyboard. Okay. Maybe next time I should change the phrase here a little bit. Anyway, so let's not worry about it. Okay, how about this one here? How do you formulate it? The language of strings with n zeros followed by n ones. I'm pretty sure this is a typical example you saw in 2001. How would you formulate this using set comprehension? Anybody? Anybody want to try before maybe Harry has his sound thought, which is okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, let's try this one. Okay, yeah. For sometimes the exercise, I can just give you a solution directly, but for this one, we can try. Okay, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Poorly drawn. X1? XY. Sure. The bar, yes. X is equal to 1. Let's uh, just remind us what the problem is over here n zeros followed by n ones. x is equal to zero. That's it. The braces. Okay. Do you, Conjunction? Um, what, what symbol are you talking about? Uh, yeah, brackets. brackets? You mean brackets? Yeah. No, uh, around those conjunctions. Just around those yeah. Okay, just this, right? Yeah. This one as well? Yeah. And then? And? Sure. Length of x, okay. <laughs> now, uh, yeah, you're getting somewhere. You're getting somewhere. So, can I just interrupt quickly, if you don't mind? Okay. Maybe you meant something like this. W1, W2, somehow. And then, you can say W1 is a member of maybe zero plus and w2 one plus uh star zeros and ones and also w1 w2 something like that i'm kind of inspired by your solution the slide has got a different one but this one i believe that might just work would you agree Good. Good to have your agreement and also your approval. Good. All right. This one is nice, but if you look at the solution on your slides, that's just another possibility. Let's take a look. And this one over here will just be zero and one n, basically repetitions, right? Zero repeated for n times, one repeated for n times. 
All right, so this one here, I'm not going to bother you, but how would you specify that? This one here, it's not so, I don't think, I'm not sure if that's actually possible unless you define a helper function to do that. Otherwise, this one here, we just do that to say the number of zeros, it will be equal to the number of ones in W about occurrences. Okay, so I would say in the course or in the exam, if I do believe you can specify the Boolean part completely formal, I will let you know. Otherwise, I might just want you to write in English. I'll be very clear about it. Okay. All right. Let me move on. Okay. Uh, there will be some exercises for you. Okay. For this one here, uh, one and two, you can take a look, and then I was maybe I can discuss one of them on Thursday. Give it a try. Okay. So they will give you some example. And this one here, easy. What? Somebody try. Robbie, you want to try? Second one? Will there be any proving? Pr proving. You mean like a proofs? Yeah. For Chris, no, uh, let me answer that question uh, maybe on Thursday oh. once I get a better idea. I'm inclined not to uh, have proofs just yet. Yeah. But I'll confirm. Yes. Good. So Robbie's question was, will there be any proofs in quiz number one next week? I will confirm on Thursday, but inclined not to have proofs just for the first one. Okay, I don't mean to make it very hard. Anybody want to try? This one here, just to explain. They are both valid languages, but what's really the difference? Can you put it in words? Henry. That's true, but how would you characterize the language more directly? Uh, Only one. Mm -hmm. Good. The first language there, which is over here, has only a set or recognizes only one string, which is epsilon, empty string, which is also a string. And the second one accepts nothing. All right, good. Okay, number three, you can try this. This is also very easy to prove, this one here, very easy. I'll leave that to you guys. And number four, also another proof or disapprove. Okay, also some hints. And number five as well, All right? I'll try to maybe go over some of them on Thursday, but you guys give it a try. I think that might also help you review uh, what we have covered so far. Okay, also hints here. Okay, do you guys have any questions about languages? Hmm? They are different. Uh, different because, because it's a good question here. You need to have a sharp eye. Look at this here. Look at this here. Be careful, right? Okay, the final level, we got alphabets, we got string, we got language. Finally, we got problem, okay? Given a language over some alphabets, a problem is really about decision on checking membership, all right? So basically we wanna say if whether or not a string is a member of the language, right? Remember language is a set of strings. Very easy question here, but I would like some answer from you guys. Do you think checking this is equivalent to checking this? Yes or no? And justify. Before I have to point to Henry. Your name? William. William. Okay, now no, no two names. William, please compete with him. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Go, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I'm gonna say I like that. Okay, why not? Um, uh, uh, sigma star is just all the strings, mm -hmm. and the language might be a little more restrictive. Exactly. Okay. So if you guys just recall very briefly, all right, when we define L, we say L is a subset of sigma star, right? Could be the same, but usually they are different. Should be smaller. So that's why when you say W is a member of L. That implies W is a member of sigma star versus W is a member of sigma star. W is a member of L. I'm pretty sure you know which one should be valid in general, which one should not be, right? This one here should not be the case 
necessarily always. But this one here is always the case because you can think about if this is sigma star, L could be simply just a part of it, right? Are you guys okay with this? Okay, I'll take silence and yes. Very good, all right? And then, okay, Java program. Well, this one, I'm, gonna, I, I'm not going to bother you too much. That one there is, when it, when, uh, if you wanna compile a Java program that's input by the user, what you're gonna do is like a membership. You wanna ask if the input string entered by the user using the keyboard is a member of the language of Java, basically, right? Okay, so that's about the four levels we should know uh, uh, in the context of lexical analysis, right? All right, if, uh, assuming there's no problem here, let's now move on. Let's talk about regular expression. I'm hoping that I can finish everything related to regular expression, and then on Thursday, I can finish hopefully most of the, uh, the DFA, NFA, Epsilon, NFA kind of stuff, I'm hoping. We'll see, okay. But I don't want to go too fast, but if I'm too slow, you can also let me know. Okay, regular, regular expressions. We have some math uh, problems to solve together, okay? Regular expression is just one way for defining a language, okay? Basically, if you write, just remember this conceptually, if you write some regular expression, it should correspond to a language, meaning that it should correspond to a set of strings. That's what you wanna remember, okay? Everything we're gonna talk about in the next, uh, maybe 10 or 15 minutes or even longer is gonna be along this line. It would be, okay, so we say that equally expressive, meaning that Given a regular ex uh, expression, you can always find an equivalence diagram and vice versa, okay? They are equivalent in terms of the expressive power. Of course, they look very different. One is textual, the other one is diagrammatic. But we'll get to these diagrams from Thursday, hopefully. And texture look like a little bit like a programming language. And when you actually use the Antler 4 uh, parser generator, you will need a regular expression. But they are quite standard, so you don't need to worry too much. Okay. Do you guys, well, I haven't really kind of formally reviewed or introduced regular expression just yet, but do you guys know what this really means? What, what, what I want you to do is to think about how we can recognize what, the, uh, what language is being represented by this, what set of strings is being denoted by this. Can we write a corresponding set comprehension or maybe it's with some other set operator to denote the set of strings. I'm gonna put this on a clean page so we guys can think about this one here. I'm gonna put it on the iPad first. Just bear with me. That one there is going to be zero, one star. Can you see it? You cannot see it. No, no, not, not yet. I, I'm just, I let you guys think. Yes. Okay, I thought you couldn't see that. Yeah. There we go. Okay, this one here denotes some language. Some language. Which would be a set of strings. And what set is that? I can give you a little bit hints. For this one here, you don't necessarily have to use, uh, you can use uh, maybe a different logical operator, or you can use maybe two different sets and try to apply some operator on top. That's also fine. How about we try with this first one here? Do you guys remember what this really means? Looks like zero followed by at least one once, at least one, or one star means it could be zero or more once, right? How would you just specify this expression over here into a set comprehension? How would you say that? The set of strings which start with zero followed by zero or more once. How do we set, specify that in the set comprehension? Yes, go ahead. Zero. One. And then? 
And then you mean oh, you mean zero again? No, I'm only talking about this one here, right? I think uh, maybe that does not seem right. It cannot. It cannot actually. Once you get a one, you cannot get zero. I don't think. This one here actually basically is saying zero followed by zero or more once. If you ever followed by any uh, like a character or symbol, it must be one. But you, you're here actually having zero again. That's not possible. Right? Okay. So this may not be right. Okay. Why don't we try together? Okay. If you don't mind, I'm gonna wipe it off. Okay. Let's see. For this one here, it would be the set of string. There are two parts. Or well, you can simply say zero as the first part always. And then followed by some x. And this part over here, you can simply say x is simply a member of one star. Right? That's something we said before. One here, this set is a single alphabet. Alphabet with only one. And all the strings with all the, uh, sorry, I think, yes. Alphabet here, and all the string with any length, that will be x, including epsilon. All right? And I'm going to go right into it. There are, two possible, there are two possible ways for you to complete this. Because you also need to handle the plus. Plus means either satisfy this or satisfy that, right? That's a plus in the regular expression. Okay? So we got two possibilities. Either you can say union with, that's what you will see in the slides. 1, and then maybe x, such that x is a member of 0 star. Right? You can, can see the uh, kind of symmetry. This part here is corresponding to this. This part here is corresponding to that. Either that, or another way, which I want to show to you. Another way to do it would be I can have a single set comprehension over here. I can say 0x over here. I can say x 1 star. Or x is 0 star. Oh, let me write it more properly. Right? Either way is fine. So here, you can see that you can definitely feel free to use the logical operator. And for those of you, who took a 1090? Yes. Oh yeah, yeah, you're you're right. I agree with you. So what I should say is, how about this? Let's say y here. How about that? Right? So this kind of specified the two. We are saying that it's going to be y followed by x. When y is equal to 0, x will be this. When y is equal to 1, x will be this. But it can be either case. Make sense to you? Yes. Good. Awesome. Thank you. William. Oh, it's kind of overloaded. I, I, I know what you mean. So the, okay, I see, that's a good question here. So what William's concern was, you can see this plus over here is a little bit like an addition. It's like a binary operator, but it's kind of overloaded. If you see later, for example, if I if you see zero plus only, that's also plus, but that one's like a unary operator. It'll be one or more occurrences. Yeah. Uh, they exist. Uh, not sure. Uh, it's. Uh, I'm kind of uh, using this for the textbook. So this one is more from the theoretical one. So you can definitely. Okay, that's good. I think uh, what I present in the slide is more like a theoretical uh, ones, but you can definitely find the corresponding ones in the specific maybe programming language. That's okay. I mean, uh, we, what we try to teach more in this lecture will be theory. But you can definitely find what will be the corresponding theory ones. Can you do us a favor? Which language were, were you talking about? Perl? Perl? Try to see if they got anything similar to this. 
Yeah. Sure, you can find it out. I, I, I know it right now. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll do it after class, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, and then we'll, we can mention that next time. Yes, there's no urgency for this, don't worry. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Okay, let me move on. Okay. Okay. This one very quickly, just to see if anybody can spot very quickly. What is this? Informally. I'll give a little bit of hints. Try to see the pattern that's represented by this sub pattern over here, this one. And then we're saying that that one there can repeat for as many times as we like, including zero times. And then you will follow by exactly one, one. And then you can end by as many zero as you like, including no zeros. Okay, anybody just guess, that's okay. I know, I know this one takes time to see. You want to give it a try? The string has an odd number of ones. That's pretty good. Did you guess? Or I'm pretty sure you thought about it, right? Yeah. Good. Okay. All right. That's correct. Okay. Basically, okay, you guys can think a little bit more if you don't agree. This part here is about the even number of ones can repeat for as many times as possible, including zero times. In which case, you got zero times once. Zero is also an even number. And then, you follow by exactly one one at the end, meaning that it will make it odd. That's the insight. Okay, think about it. Okay. Okay. Anyway, so for a regular expression, we just say that it's a bit more user friendly compared with uh, maybe others. Okay. But for your uh, assignment number one, you will get a chance to actually touch both the regular expression and also the diagram notation. Okay. What well, we'll talk about? I'll try to go over assignment a little bit with you about a high picture. Okay, so that's pretty much like an algebraic expression. Okay, and then they're provably equivalent. And here, don't worry, when I, when I say provably equivalent, we're not going to go over the proofs. That'll be too much for this course. At least, you should really uh, recall that particular diagram which I spoke about in the, well, the, uh, if I can just show to you. This diagram is really important. Let me just get there, and then give me a moment. This diagram here. Just remember this commuting diagram here. Just remember once you get your regular expression over here, you can, com you can convert eventually to the DFA. Just remember that. And then we're going to see how to do conversion one by one. That's what we'll do. Okay. Let me move back. Okay, so we're going to do a little bit of language operate, but before that, why don't we take attendance now? Okay, to give you guys some credit. Okay, just get ready. Uh, I'll be ready in just 30 seconds. Okay, I'm gonna start a course. And then, oh, sorry, not this one here, this one here, okay. Give me a moment. Yeah, take some time. There we go. 4032, uh, 4302, start a class. Yeah, and you know what? For the polling, I'll just get a normal, very dumb question over here, just for the purpose of taking attendance over here. There you go. Yeah, please select. Robbie, yours is done? Yeah. Okay, anybody want me to wait a little bit longer? I can wait, just another 30 seconds if you want me to. Are you okay? Okay, 22, not bad. Current enroll number is about 26, 22. Pretty good. Thank you guys, thank you. I'll stop now, okay? No more argument after I stop it, right? Please, if you got issue, you gotta raise your hand right now. Okay. There we go. Thank you. All right, done. 
All right, let me close it. And then let me go back. Oh, how about we take a two minutes break? I think it might be nice. Okay, don't go away, just two minutes and then we'll resume. So, so what, what, what is that pro operator you were think, thinking about? Uh, yes, you may. Uh, Go ahead, you can write it here. Oh, vertical bar. Yeah. Okay, interesting. It's a side effect because this creates a capturing group. You create a? This creates a group. When you, like, when you like, run this through a regex bar, so mm -hmm. this creates a capturing group. Okay. So it's not, it's what version has no side effects like this. Oh. But this uh, only matters if you care about how it parses. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, it's too, too many language specific things, but thanks, okay. Might mention that maybe next time. Awesome, thank you. It's for Perl, right? Uh, this is Perl and also JavaScript. JavaScript, okay. Okay, good. Yeah, we'll try to resume in one minute. Okay. I think uh, we should resume. All right. And we're still in the topic of regular expressions. And now we want to just dive a little bit deeper into formally define what the regular expressions w uh, are. And if you recall from the previous slides, when I talk about zero one star plus one zero star, like uh, what Henry asked me before, what does plus really mean? Well, he hasn't seen that before. So now we're gonna define the formal meaning for the language, okay? So we're gonna define what it really means for the plus to be there and what it really means for the star to be there. That's something we're gonna define. Okay, very quick, go over definition. Okay, and do you guys know what the answer is? Let's say I got a s alphabet, let's say zero and one. What would be the simplest regular expression to write out of that alphabet, the simplest one? Let me make it more precise just in case you may not understand exactly what I'm asking. Let's say this, let me just get, let's say alphabet over here is zero and one. Okay, and then what would be the simplest regular expression to write? Simplest in the sense that it's the shortest. Okay, let's let Henry let us know. Empty string, uh, so for the purpose of this, we don't really have the empty string, the regular expression, not really. Um, I would say empty string, yes. How about, let me put it, yeah, I see what you mean. Let me put some restriction. I don't want to get too complicated. You can revise your answer. A single zero or a single one. Basically, just a symbol, basically, it's like a sigma one, basically, okay? So it will be either zero, or one, okay? That's the simplest you can write. If you guys recall earlier last week, or maybe the week before, when we talk about the while loop, right? We say that the regular expression for the while will be W-H-I-L-E, similar idea. So if I want to specify out of this alphabet sounds the simplest regular expression that's not empty, that will be just a single symbol. That's basically a string of length one, okay? Just, uh, that's kind of the base case. And we're gonna build on top. Okay, so yeah, that's uh, what I just said. 
And then let's say here, we're going to do a little bit of recursive definition here. So I'm going to do it together with you. It's rather simple definition, but it's good to know how we derive them. Now we're going to assume we got two languages, L and M. And in order to really build the compound regular expressions, we need to know what operator we can really use to uh, build them, right? Let's now talk about uh, one by one, okay? Okay, so we got three here, and we can also do some examples together, okay? The union is actually rather easy over here. Let me give you example, and then you can tell me how to formulate it. How about that, okay? Let's say we got L here, we got M here. And by the way, L and M, they don't necessarily overlap. They may, but not necessarily, okay? But they might, their intersection may be non-empty, maybe, okay? This one is easy. Basically, if we say a language L, union with a language M. That one is going to be simply all these strings union together, right? This will be just uh, every string, A, B, B, C, C, A, B, A, and C, B. For this one here, I'm not going to bother you. It's simply just going to be this. Let's try to take a look. And then the next two, we should really do it together. This is state. If I got language L, language N, if I apply the union language operator upon these two languages, it's going to be another language where the string can either be from L or from M. That was straightforward, all right? And let's talk about concatenation. This one a little bit more interesting. Concatenation simply means I'm going to have, let's say this, it's going to be another language, right? Let me use the L and M, for example. Every string in the new set is going, going to have two parts. The first part is going to come from L. The second part is going to come from M. That's the principle. Based on what we got L and M, how many members should we get for this new language? How many? Six. Awesome. That's good enough. Good. Thank you. Well, for the purpose of completeness, why don't we enumerate them? Okay, A, B here, B, A here. Oh, there's, there's no space, by the way, okay? And also A, B here, C, B here, and also B, C, B, A, and also B, C, C, B, C, A. Oh, beg your pardon. Let me just undo it. B, C, C, B, C, A, B, A. C A, C B, just to make it a hundred percent clear. You can see each string over here contains two parts. The orange part comes from L. The pink part comes from M. Concatenation. That's the definition for language concatenation. All right. That's about one example. You guys' job as scientists is to generalize this into set comprehension. Your name? Matthew. Matthew. I'll remember. Matthew, go ahead. Uh, yeah, let me write it up. Give me a moment. Sorry. Let me move. A set? Sure. And then? Uh, yeah, that's straightforward. I agree. W is a member of L, and M is a member of, oh, sorry, that doesn't make sense, does it? V, a member of M. Is that what you meant? Awesome, I agree. Except I use XY, but that's okay, doesn't matter. All right, that's actually good. All right, and the final one. The final one requires a little bit of build up. Okay, the final one. When, I, when we say L star over here, okay, it's basically to say, well, let's think about what L zero is. Let's think about what L one is. Let's think about what L two is, and then etc. That'll be kind of the idea. Why don't we go just for a few, and then I'll go back to the slide to save some time. What's L zero? That's basically from before, right? It's going to be all the string with a length zero. 
which will be a singleton set, epsilon. And then this one over here, basically all the string with length 1. And this one, all the string with length 2. L star is going to union all such language together. That's what you will do. Cleaning star. I'm pretty sure you have seen this before. Let me save some time by going back to the slides. Okay, so if you look at that over here, L1 and then L2 and etc. Right? And it would be worth. Oh, I beg your pardon. I actually said something wrong. Let me take it back. Almost confused you. Okay. Here, I want you to look at the concatenate uh, by definition. When we say a language to the power, that really goes back to where I said in the beginning. I've just confused myself and you guys. I apologize. Let me take a look. Remember I said in the very beginning, if, if I got to the power of k, in the case of uh, sigma and in the case of l, they mean different things. Okay, I just confused myself, okay, and also you guys. Let's say this. Let me clarify them right away in a separate page. Okay. If I say sigma to the power of k versus a language to the power of k, okay, so here this means all the strings with length k. That's what we said before. And this one here is about k concatenations of strings chosen from L. They're different. Okay, just don't get confused like me. All right. Having this in mind, so if we go back here. L1 is actually going to be basically, by definition, just one concatenation, right? One concatenation, let's say that concatenation is x. And then x will be just from L. And that one, obviously, just L. Right? L to the power of 1, just L. That was easy. And how about this one here? Can anybody try this one according to our definition? L to the power of 2. How does that mean all the strings of length 2? Apparently not, right? I'm trying to confuse you again, right? It should be the concatenations of two things. Each one of them is drawn from that, from that language. Different, all right? How would we define this over here? William, please. Yeah, easy, right? Yeah, exactly. But of course, if L contains, for example, like a string like a, of length 2, in that case, you wouldn't get exactly that length. That's predictable, right? So that's something you got to be careful. All right, and etc. And we're going to union all these together. That's what you will see on the slides. OK, like that. OK, that's uh, the, just the I. Uh, concatenation. You're going to union all of them. So that's using the generalized union notation and then starting from zero. Right? Okay, two more exercises for us. What would this be? Oh, this one is something we did before, I'm pretty sure, right? Oh, actually different. A little bit different. What we did before is a sigma, but now it's L to the I. Right? Let me put it down here. So given a language L, what's the cardinality of L to the power of I? And the I here, again, does it really mean all the strings of length I? No. That means I concatenations from the, la from the language string. However, what should be the cardinality of this? How many possible combinations of concatenation can we have? Anybody? Just I? OK. That, wouldn't that be too simple? For example, let's say in this case, if we got, let's say, L to the power of 2, then we got x and y. 
x can be chosen from any member from L. Right? So I would be too simple, wouldn't it? I to the power of I. <laughs> nice fix, but no. <laughs> Not right. <laughs> Anybody want to try? It would be similar to the sigma to the power of I, similar. Okay. Henry? Yeah, because for every concatenation over here, the number of possibility we can draw from X for, draw, uh, for drawing X will be the cardinality of L. Right? Okay, good. Yeah, we cover many small details today, but just make sure you know how to you know, derive them because you might just forget you know, in the quiz or in the exam. Little exercise for you, which I can give, go over with you if you need help. Think about for each one of these, what would be the cardinality? For example, what would be the cardinality for this? What would be the cardinality for this? What would be the cardinality for this? That will be the optional exercise for you. And when I say optional, you better do it. Yeah, Please do it. All right, think about it. Let's go back. Aha, uh -huh, one more. Let's say L is the language of all the strings where each string contains only zero, including no zeros, either epsilon or one zero, two zeros, and etc. What is L star? You know what? Conceptually, it looks, looks very confusing, right? What is that? Well, why don't we try? Oh, by, by the way, let's see what the answer is. The answer is incredibly simple, just L. The, 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 maybe that was, that's what you thought? Good. But why? Of course, in the quiz, I might just ask you to justify. Why don't we try this very quickly? Let me write it down, and then I'll switch to the iPad. Give me one moment. Let's say L would be zero star. What is? L star, okay. All right, I'll give you a little bit of hints. By definition, but what, what is uh, L star by definition? If you guys remember. Henry. Uh, L some number of times. Mm, not quite. We need union in this case. Uh, you can revise your answer L using union. Or what, what are the possible values for star? L, L is better than L, but I think L is Good. I wanted to say about uh, We can talk about your conciseness maybe after class. And if that's worth discussing, we'll mention that next time. Mm, I would say we wouldn't go for that in this case. Yeah, we, when we need, really want to go for recursive definition, we may go for that. But for this one, we don't need to. Yeah, good. Thank you. And then L2, and et cetera, right? OK. Let's try quickly. What is L0, given that L is this? Empty set? OK. This one, actually, I'll tell you how, you how you figure. This one is not talking about. Sorry, this one is not really talking about like a, a length zero. It's about zero concatenation, right? Since you're doing zero concatenation, so you can only get an empty string. Okay, so that's what you'll get. Okay, so you will be zero concatenation according to your definition. Okay, union. How about this one here? By definition, it's going to be x, just one concatenation, right? And then x is basically zeros. And union, this one, let's do it quickly, and then it will be x, y, such that x is zeros, and also y is zeros. 
And if you see the pattern go on, basically we're talking about just zeros, which is what the original language is about. That's why they are equivalent. So if I really want to ask, uh, if you really want to answer this question completely, number one, you can tell me it's simply equivalent to L. Number two, that's kind of the derivation process you want to show to, to see how you derive the answer. Okay. Good. Okay, so maybe about uh, seven minutes or so, we're done. Okay, we'll go as much as possible. All right, so now we can define recursively like what, like, uh, what Henry really wants. Okay. Let's see how we can do that. So what we want to define the, uh, recur uh, the rec uh, we want to define recursively the regular expressions. So we got base case, we got recursive case. And let's go over one by one very quickly. And for each one of them, we ought to know what that particular regular expression is denoting certain language. Let's see. Okay, let's see here. Oh, over here. Let's now look at base cases, right? Remember, if you want to define something recursively, don't forget about base cases. That's, a, that's about the terminating cases. Let's talk about base cases first. If you, you can specify epsilon if you want to. I think uh, Harry mentioned about epsilon before, like an empty string earlier in the class. It's actually possible, okay? We'll see it on an example, either today or next time. So if you only, okay, so think about what's happening over here. Just don't get confused what's going on. These, these over here are the regular expression. This one here is also a regular expression, okay? We are saying that if, if you specify this particular regular expression, what is the corresponding language, meaning the set of strings, that's actually denoted by this particular regular expression? Okay, let me just write this down very quickly, just for this one here. Okay, this one here, given a written regular expression. For example, just epsilon. That's the regular expression. L of epsilon denotes a language, set of strings. Okay? And for epsilon, it's very easy. It will simply just be a singleton set. It's a set, but with only one element, epsilon. There's another case which will be also very useful, as we'll see later, is simply just empty set, uh, theoretically. There could be also a regular expression. Just as, what would be the language corresponding to your uh, empty set? Well, just empty language, okay? Like that. Okay, so these are the base cases. One more, and then we'll get to the recursive one. If you write only A, like a, sing, uh, like a single uh, character, from the, from the alphabet. That would simply just suggest only just a string of length one of that particular symbol, right? Like that. So these are the three base cases. And you will see some interesting properties that we have to go through possibly on Thursday of using these ones, we'll see, all right? Let's now go over all the regular expression operator very quickly, and then maybe we should, uh, should be done soon. We have, oh, Henry, just uh, look it up. So this one here, if you go in Perl and also JavaScript, am I right? Okay, so I believe in other programming language, you can say vertical bar with some side conditions, which you can definitely look further. But for this course, you're definitely gonna stick to plus, which is more at a conceptual level, okay? So we got, just for your information, vertical bar is for Perl, also JavaScript. We got plus, and we got concatenation of two languages, and also we got E star, and also we got E, right? Meaning that we can just put parentheses around for our regular expression. The right-hand side, before I reveal them, each one of them is actually not very surprising because we already covered in the previous page about different language operations. That's why we introduced them first. So now on the right-hand side, we can use exactly those, all right? And this one here, if we say either this or this, what would be the corresponding language? 
for that regular expression. It should be, let me give you an option here. If I say it's simply equal to E union F, is that correct? You kind of know what I mean, but is that really correct? William said yes, it's correct. Correct? Yeah. Sure, thank you. Anybody think that's correct? Henry, okay, keep that note first. Anybody? Let me rephrase the question, it's very important, all right? When I write the regular expression E plus F, so E is a regular expression, F is another regular expression, and then I put a plus in between. I'm saying the corresponding language of this is simply E union F. Presumably it denotes some set of strings. And in case William doesn't want to change his mind, he said yes, that's correct. Do you want to change your mind? Well, not yet. Yeah, exactly. So you should, yeah, so that should be no. Yeah, that's not right because E and F they are regular expression. How can you union regular expression? It's a category error. And Henry, go ahead. How do we fix it? Yes, guys, it's a very important category clarification, right? This one here I put is incorrect because E is not a set, F is not a set. But if I say the language of E union the language of F. That would be correct. Imagine that you're trying to define a recursive function or method L. In order for me to figure out how to define this, I need to recursively call on E, recursively call on F, a union them together. That's basically what, what I'm doing. Right? You want to understand very well why one is correct, one is the other one is incorrect. Okay. And following similar thought, if I say regular expression E followed by regular expression F concatenation basically, right? What would be the corresponding here? Anybody? Similar thought, yes. This one here, E union F. You mean L of E? E union F? Like that? Sure, thank you for trying. Okay, but <laughs> it may not be so correct. That's okay. That's okay. You'd rather be correct being corrected by me here in the quiz, right? The, again, you cannot union regular expressions. You cannot. Also, this concept over here is E followed by F. It's not about union. Like I to say either this or this, right? Anybody? And let me, okay, I don't want to cause any, that's wrong, okay? Any more try? Anyone? William. Uh, can we just stick at L of E right beside L of F to say that they're compatible? Yeah, absolutely. So okay. And this is okay because if you look at the previous page, we do have definition for language concatenation. Okay, awesome. Let, let me just say one more thing and we've got one more and then we're done for today. Okay. So this part over here is we're using language concatenation. concatenation. And this one, obviously, since we're using star here, right? It should be star. The language of E and then star, right? Similar thought. And it, whenever you got any parentheses to force the order of evaluation, well, basically, it will still be out of E. It doesn't change the meaning for the language, right? All right, I think up to here, we already covered quite many details. I think uh, maybe on Thursday, we will be able to move maybe slightly faster, okay? Any question up to now? Hey, you may want to study ahead because uh, what your quiz number one is definitely covered until today, but more, whatever I'm going to cover on Thursday. All right, I'll see you on Thursday. You guys take care.